um, as, we, as we close off our discussions of World War II, we want to talk about the, the aftermath of the war, and we're going to start with talking about the absolutely unparalleled carnage of the Second World War. Um, we're going to throw out some numbers. I do not expect you guys to memorize these numbers. I just want you to kind of hear them and recognize that this is like nothing that's ever happened um, in the world before. And, and I actually believe it's nothing that will ever happen in the world again, but we can have that conversation uh, later. We're looking at uh, 36 million European dead, with, with almost 23 million of those being European civilians. These numbers, you might see slightly different numbers in different locations, uh, because a lot of the, when you start getting into this kind of, of, of counting, we've got some estimates going on, and we've got different demographers that are using different statistics to, to come up with these numbers. Uh, just know that it is by far the most deadly war in human history. The bulk of these deaths in Europe are in the Eastern Theater, and I think we've already talked about this, right? The Eastern Theater, where Adolf Hitler had the express goal of the elimination of what he would call the, the Untermensch, or the subhumans of the Slavs and of the Jews in Eastern Europe. 17.2% of Poland would be killed. No country on a per capita basis loses more human lives than Poland. If the United States, through some tragedy, were to lose 17% of its population today, that would be upwards of 70 million people. So, so this is a, a ridiculously massive number, and it's a number that Americans really can't, can, or at least Americans who have no connection maybe with something like the, the American Civil War, for example, which obviously none of us do, we can't fathom these numbers. Yes? The Eastern Theater of, of the War, that's a good question. So uh, if, I, if I haven't made this clear, in World War II, we've, there are two main theaters of war. There's the Pacific Theater, and then there's the European Theater. All right? So the Pacific Theater is kind of, kind of like in World War I, we would talk about the Western Front and the Eastern Front, but World War II is so much bigger. So we've got the Pacific Theater of War, and then we've got the European Theater. Now we're zooming in on the European Theater, and you might talk about things like the Eastern War or the Eastern Theater. Within there, we're talking about Eastern Europe or the Mediterranean or the Italian campaign or the Western Front again. Um, so in this case, I'm talking about Eastern Europe. So the vast majority of deaths in World War II in Europe were taking place on the Eastern uh, Theater of the War. The fighting in the West and the fighting in the Mediterranean saw far less uh, civilian casualties than in, in Eastern Europe. Civilian deaths were proportional to the amount of resistance that, that the nations were fighting. And we remember, we've already talked about in, in Poland, for example, in Eastern Europe, those people knew that if they, if they ultimately lost, they would be killed. Whereas in France, if you were a French citizen, you could go on living your life, and you could live a relatively similar life to what you were living before the war. And you were not on Adolf Hitler's list of, of peoples to eradicate. Then in the, in the Pacific Theater, possibly over 30 million dead there. And the majority of those deaths are going to be Chinese civilians. So we look at this, this pie graph of, um, of the deaths in World War II, and we see two countries, the Soviet Union and China, taking a vast majority of all of the deaths in World War II. Obviously the Chinese um, at the hands of the Japanese in the Pacific. In addition to the, the human toll, we've got strategic bombing devastating cities, whether they be Japanese cities like Hiroshima and Nagasaki from atomic bombs, or Tokyo in, in uh, March of 1945, which would be firebombed in Operation, anybody? Meeting House, Operation Meeting House. Um, there might have been other, other bombing operations. Right. Okay, I'm not as familiar with that. Um, so um, the firebombing of, of dozens of Japanese cities. And then that also happened in the Western Front, or in, in, in the European theater, with the American and, and British firebombing of German cities. So um, cities would be destroyed in the Second World War. Agriculture was disrupted in most of these countries that were fighting in war. So you've got tremendous physical destruction. This is the kind of stuff that the United States in a post-war world 
our memory of World War II will be remarkably different from Soviets' memories or Germans' memories or French memories or Polish memories. We just have a hard time getting the war. We fought in the war, and we fought valiantly in the war, and we experienced massive losses in the war, 400,000 American dead. That's the, that's the second most deadly American war after the U.S. Civil War, right? So this is a huge war for the United States, but none of it, short of Pearl Harbor, was fought on American territory. Good. The other thing we need to talk about at the end of the war is the growing rift between the Allies. World War II is a kind of a weird story. World War I has a little bit of a similar story to it, where prior to World War I, you've got an alliance between France and Russia, arguably one of the most liberal democratic nations in Europe at the time, France in 1914, allying itself with the most autocratic nation in the world, Tsarist Russia in 1914. Well, in World War II, we have much the same. We've got democracies in the United States and, and, and Britain and countries that, that support ideas of free market enterprise in the United States and Britain allying themselves with the most authoritarian communist regime of Joseph Stalin. That's a, the, that makes for strange bedfellows, we, we, is the phrase. They don't seem to get along very well. But they are kept in this alliance, this grand alliance as we've called it. They're kept in this alliance because they have a mutual enemy, right? And they, they're able to overlook their differences, their ideological and political differences, because they have Nazi Germany as a mutual enemy. But once Nazi Germany is defeated in, in May of 1945, once Nazi Germany is defeated in May of 1945, now these ideological and economic and political differences can start to show themselves. And so now we get a growing rift. We're going to go immediately from the end of World War II to our discussion of the Cold War, because there is no breathing room in between these two events. All right? It's not like we all celebrate and have a few years off from tensions. Tensions will begin immediately. One of the first questions is what's going to happen with Poland? Poland is right on the, on the forefront of this line between the American world or the American-sponsored world and the Soviet world. What's going to happen to Poland? The United States and Britain want to see Poland be free. They want to see Poland have free elections. They want to see Poland be sovereign. When I use that word, do we understand that word, sovereign? Yeah, rule itself. To rule itself. Yeah, Poland gets to decide how Poland wants to be ruled. Remember, the war started, why? Because in Poland was invaded. So, as I've said before, how can you start a war to defend a sovereign Poland only at the end of that war to give Poland to the Soviet Union? That seems to be problematic. But Stalin has his own needs. And Stalin's experience in the Second World War is an experience of the biggest disaster that has ever befallen his country, maybe since the Mongols have come in. World War II cost the Soviet Union more human lives than any other nation uh, fighting in the war. And Stalin has a desire for future security. And in Stalin's mind, future security comes through occupying or controlling territory, or using this land as what we could call friendly buffer states. So if Germany were to ever amass an army again that could threaten the Soviet Union, they'd have to go through a friendly Poland first. That's what Joseph Stalin wants. Well, we certainly don't want that to happen, but Joseph Stalin's got the upper hand in this debate because what is in Poland in 1945? Yes, sir. Soviet troops. Much like the game of Risk that you guys may have played at some time in your life, when you conquer territory in the game of Risk, when you take land from your opponent in the game of Risk, you leave armies behind in every country that you take over. And as the Soviet Union expanded their reach and they liberated Eastern Europe from Nazi Germany, they leave armies behind in all of these countries they liberate. So at the end of World War II, we might really want Poland to be free. But in order to guarantee Polish freedom, that would have meant us and Britain now turning our guns onto our former allies, the Soviet Union. Whew, that's not something we're going to be ready for. So ultimately what is agreed to is that Poland is going to do a shift to the West. We're going to pick Poland up 
and we're going to move Poland to the west, and we're going to put it back down so the former eastern portion of Poland will now become the extreme west of the Soviet Union. And the former eastern portions of Germany will now become the west of Poland. And you can imagine this is going to cause some problems in Europe. Because who lives in here? Bunch of Germans. And they ain't going to live there after this border changes. And these are going to be uh, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Germans who will become German refugees who have to leave their homes. That it might have been their homes for, for centuries. They have to leave their homes and find some place new. The United Nations uh, last week just, just reminded, attempted to remind countries like Poland about the refugee crisis that they were in in the 1940s in hopes that they would be more sympathetic to whom? The current refugees that are seeking refuge in, in Europe. Um, but they, I, I think a lot of those calls are falling on deaf ears. So anyway, we also have a question with Germany. All that was agreed to at the end of World War II was that Germany would be occupied and divided, or divided and occupied. And we've already looked at this map. We've got a division between Britain and the United States and France and the Soviet Union. And then that capital of Germany, Berlin, will likewise be divided in the same way. I can. Can you give her a few minutes, though? Awesome. Thank you so much. Bye. So Germany will be divided, but there's going to be questions that remain over issues like reparations, like how much money is going to go to whom at the end of this war, questions over, over how these uh, uh, separate zones will be administered going forward, and we will talk about all these as we get more into the Cold War. One of the only true agreements to come out is that both the Soviets and the British and the Americans agree that Nazi war criminals should be put on trial after the war in a series of trials known as the Nuremberg Trials. The Nuremberg Trials. N-U-R-E-M-B-E-R-G. And I think you guys saw that depicted in that film we watched, right? For Japan... The end of the war for Japan, obviously, is an unconditional surrender. Post-war Japan will be militarily occupied by the United States. And the United States would get quickly to work drafting a new constitution for a new Japan. Aspects of that constitution include an emperor who will no longer be seen as divine and will have no political authority in Japan but he will be allowed to remain on a throne. Mm -hmm. Pictured here, this is the emperor of Japan during World War II, Emperor Hirohito, and he's standing next to Douglas MacArthur, an American general. And the United States would pledge to defend Japan as the new Japanese constitution does not allow for an offensive military for Japan. Very small military for Japan. So the United States will use our military, largely for the next 70 years till to this day, to defend the islands of Japan. This is a debate to this day. Japan wants to take more control over their own defense and wants to start building an offensive military. Because who does Japan see as a bigger threat um, or their biggest threat in the world? China. China. Yeah, growing China. Um, and... Um, and they're maybe not as confident that the United States going forward will continue um, the long-term defense we have previously provided. The Soviet Union would also occupy some Japanese territory that they liberate during the war. We remember that at the very end of the war, on August 8th, the Soviet Union jumps into war against Japan. The three months after the, uh, the defeat of Germany, they're getting involved in the war. And so they will take some lands uh, from... The, the Japanese. Um, one in particular that we'll talk about later is Soviet armies will occupy the northern portion of the Korean Peninsula, while American armies will occupy the southern portion of the Korean Peninsula. Korea was a Japanese colony at the start of World War II. And you guys can, you probably already know a little of the story that's going to come from there, but we'll deal with that at a later date. 
questions, comments, concerns.